So good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's wonderful to see you. Um, I'm Andy Rich. I'm the dean of the Colum Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership here at the City College of New York. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this, which is our eighth annual Sternberg Family Lecture. It's a conversation with the former United Nations General Secretary, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. The Sternberg Family Lecture has become an important annual tradition at the Colin Powell School, and it's our highest profile public event. And I want to begin this morning by saying my sincere thanks to Cy and to Lori Sternberg, who are with us. Cy Sternberg is a very proud graduate of City College. He has never stopped giving back to this place. He is a member of the Colin Powell School Board of Visitors. He has been since the school was created nine years ago, almost to the day, in fact. And for many years, Cy was the chairman and the CEO of the New York Life Insurance Company. During his tenure there, his company set up the largest endowment in the Colin Powell School's history, focused on supporting students and the leaders, focused on emerging African-American issues. This lectureship is fully sponsored and made possible by the Sternberg family. Cy and Lori, thank you very much. So over the years, the subjects of this lecture have varied. Higher education, immigration, climate change and sustainability. Last year, it was the civic health of this nation. This year, the topic is as important and timely as any we've ever discussed. International affairs and the role of the United Nations and in international institutions. And our guest is the most distinguished we've ever hosted, Ban Ki-moon, the eighth Secretary General to the United Nations. This is a very special morning, and in a moment I'm going to turn it over to Tony List, the Provost of City College, to make introductions and to share greetings from the college. Before I do that, I want to extend a personal welcome as well to everyone here who is visiting City College for the first time today. I know that we have many distinguished visitors from the United Nations and from the missions to the UN. I want to welcome you, and I want to thank you for being here. You come to a place, to a college, and indeed to a room, this, the Great Hall, um, that have a wonderful history. CCNY was the first free academy in the United States. It was the first place in this country that lived out the belief that higher education is for all people. This week, as we mark the Colin Powell School's ninth anniversary, we celebrate the college's 175th anniversary. And as we begin our event today, it's worth noting that the idea of public higher education in the United States really began here, back in 1847. City College is a place that believes that higher education should be a democratizing force in our society, and that it is essential that uh, for that democracy that all people have access to higher education, and that a part of that education should be a discussion of national and international affairs. So what, that's what this college has always stood for. It's certainly at the heart of the mission of the Colin Powell School, and today's event continues that tradition. And in this very special room, the Great Hall, which was inaugurated more than a century ago by Mark Twain, and has hosted the likes of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, Martin Luther King, Barack Obama, and of course, Colin Powell, it's fitting that we have the honor to host the Secretary General today. So welcome to everybody, including those of you who are watching us on the live stream, and it is now my pleasure to introduce Tony List, the Provost and the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at the City College of New York. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Colleagues, friends, distinguished guests, Mr. Secretary General, Thank you for joining us for the eighth annual Sternberg Family Lecture in Public Scholarship. Today, the City College of New York has the rare privilege of hosting the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, for a discussion of global affairs. As Dean Rich said, um, this is the 175th anniversary of the City College of New York. We're exceptionally proud of our legacy and our mission and we are so happy to begin to be able to fill this hall with live human beings again after several years. Today's discussion has been made possible by the generous support of Cy and Laurie Sternberg, longtime friends of City College. Cy is a proud CCNY graduate. 
a member of the Foundation for City College and of the Board of Visitors of the Colin Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership. The Sternberg Family Lecture has informed and inspired generations of students by giving them access to fascinating conversations about the urgent issues of our time. This year, the Sternbergs made a gift that will establish the Sternberg Family Professor of Leadership in the Colin Powell School. We are deeply grateful for your generosity and your belief in City College. Thank you, Cy and Lori. We speak so often of what the graduates of City College contribute to New York City. But today, thanks to the Secretary General's presence, is an opportunity to reflect on City College's place in the global conversation. For example, the State Department's diplomat in residence who represents the tri-state area is in residence at CCNY. The Charles B. Rangel Center for Public Service, which promotes the Rangel Fellowship and that expands and diversifies the Foreign Service, is in this very building. And of course, one of our most famous graduates, remarkable Secretary of State, Colin Powell, who gave back to this institution by developing the Colin Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership. He was an inspiring presence on this campus and we miss him dearly. It's a privilege for us to reflect today on the tenure of one of the most prominent international figures at a time of profound global change and challenge. We look forward to the Secretary General's insights into the responsibilities and duties of the leader of an organization that is, quoting from the UN website, the one place on earth where all the world's nations can gather together, discuss common problems, find shared solutions that benefit all of humanity. Ban Ki-moon served as the United Nations eighth Secretary General, holding that role from 2007 to 2016. One of the Secretary General's first major initiatives was the 2007 Ch Climate Change Summit, which placed the issue, issue at the forefront of global agenda and resonates strongly with much of what we do on this campus. At the time of his election as the Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon was his country's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade. His 37 years of service with the ministry included postings in, with in New Delhi, Washington, D.C., and Vienna. In those years, he was responsible for portfolios covering foreign policy advisor to the president, deputy minister for policy planning, and director general of American affairs. That work expanded over the years with assignments that included service as the chairman of the preparatory commission for the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty, and chef de cabinet, head of office, during the Republic of Korea's 2001-2002 presidency of the UN General Assembly. Mr. Bon has also been actively involved in issues relating to inter-Korean relations. We're honored that our own Jean Kresno and our archivists at the CCNY Library have taken a leadership role in preserving the legacy of the Secretary General through the Papers Project. Over the last five years, Jean and her team have painstakingly sifted through nearly a million documents affiliated with the Secretary General's tenure, culling them down to the most important representations of history and placing them online for worldwide access and use. When future writers and journalists and scholars researched the years that Ban Ki-moon directed the UN, it will be this pool of information that they will inevitably draw from. For that, I thank Jean and her team for their accomplishment and their work. Today's talk will help us delve deeper into the role of the Secretary General, the scope of the Secretary General's work, and the overall climate of the international arena today. How do we make sense of today's events given the outbreak of the horrible war in Europe again? How should, we, how should controversial international policies like NATO expansion be approached? What were some of the most crucial highlights of the Secretary General's tenure? These are some of the many questions that we will tackle today. And so, without further ado, it's my distinct privilege to introduce the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. 
And I would like to invite Dean Rich back to the stage who will be in conversation with the Secretary General. Thank you all. Thank you all again for being with us today. And we're looking forward to a really robust conversation about global affairs, about the, the opportunities that the former uh, Secretary General had at his, in his time at the UN, and, um, and about the opportunities for young people, frankly, who are interested in public affairs. We're going to spend probably the next 30 minutes, 35 minutes in conversation up here, and then we will open it up for questions. So if you have questions, you'll have a chance to go to the mic uh, in the middle of the room towards the end of the session and pose your question. Um, so Mr. Secretary General, I want to start, I want to start with current affairs, if I might, um, and perhaps the most high profile and dangerous situation in, in the world right now, Ukraine. Um, I, I understand that you are a member of the elders and, and I, and that you have the opportunity at times to continue to advise and support peace building around the world. Um, and, and I wonder if you might reflect on what's going on in, the, in Ukraine right now and, 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 and where the UN um, factors into decision making. The, thank you very much, uh, Professor Andrew Rich. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank uh, for to uh, uh, Provost Professor Tony, Tony Lees for your very kind introduction about me. And I also would like to thank um, Sai and Lowy uh, Sternberg uh, for <coughs> your contribution as well as for your support uh, for this um, uh, meeting could be possible. Thank you. I hope uh, you will continue to support uh, this kind of uh, academic um, uh, research activities. And I really appreciate all the distinguished professors and students who are here today and I'd like to particularly recognize the presence of uh, Ambassador Jo Hyun, who is now permanent representative uh, to the United Nations. I thank you very much for your participation. Before I, <coughs> <coughs> Before I answer uh, your question, just let me take just uh, two, three minutes. Uh, uh, I am deeply honored to be invited to this um, uh, very important uh, gathering. Uh, I know that uh, Colin Powell, the late Colin Powell general, uh, has been, was, I think, student here. And he made a great contribution, not only to the United States, but to world peace and the security and development. For me, personally, I have worked very closely uh, with him as a counterpart. When he was a Secretary of State, I was a foreign minister of Korea. Before that, he had been receiving a lot of admiration and love from uh, Korean people. I often heard from him, among so many distinguished jobs he had held, then he was always uh, speaking about uh, how how much proud he was of having contributed to peace and security on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, particularly, twice, I think he served twice in Korea. Uh, once as a battalion commander in Pochon, in Pochon. That's uh, quite near to de demilitarized zone. Of course, he is a great uh, statesman, great diplomat, and great soldier. Now, I am very glad to see that uh, this uh, uh, City College of New York is now uh, trying to honor uh, his leadership and his commitment by having Colin Powell School of Civic and Global uh, Leadership. That's very nice and very proper, and I really appreciate uh, your taking such um, 
his leadership to inspire young students and motivate us to do much more to promote peace and security. As a former Secretary General, I also, I didn't expect that he would leave us so early. It was 2020, September, when I and he was invited by the Korean Military Academy. Without knowing that he would leave just one year after that, before several hundred military cadets of Korean, Korean military cadets, I and he had spent at least one and a half an hour talking about the youth empowerment, peace and security of the international community, and peace and security of the Korean Peninsula, etc. So that he really inspired so many people, not only military cadets, but many Koreans who are watching through uh, virtual, virtual means. I, I sincerely hope that uh, we will really be inspired and motivated by his leadership. And I'm particularly counting on young students uh, who will really uh, uh, be inspired and motivated by him. So with this brief introduction, uh, I'd like to make some, some of my comments about your, uh, uh, before that, I'd like to particularly recognize Professor Jean Krasno. I think she is uh, some. <laughs> this morning, I had about an hour long, you know, uh, meeting with her in my hotel. The, the collected papers of UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, which was uh, compiled and researched by Professor Jean Krasno. I was uh, deeply touched, deeply grateful for her just a five, and five year long research to have made all the documents in chronological, analytical way. I hope all this document, which is the result of um, tens of thousands of UN staff working together with me during my time as a Secretary General, will be usefully inspire and motivate the people. Again, I thank you very much, uh, Professor Krasno, for your hard work and your contribution. Thank you very much. Now let me, let me answer your question. I, I think all the, all the political leaders and citizens may have different, different views. But what is just not different, one clear answer would be that Russian aggression of Ukraine is totally not acceptable and it is a you know, it should be uh, criticized as strong as possible, as strong as possible way. I'm a member of the Elders. The Elders is a private organization. It's a just that there are only 10, 10 persons. This Elders was founded by Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela about uh, 10, 12 years ago. It is consists of former global leaders or Nobel Peace Laureates. They have not been mandated by any organization. We are on our own, using and preaching and speaking out on our own moral authority. We have only moral authorities. We don't have any physical authorities once, as once we used to have. They were the presidents, and I was the Secretary General of the United Nations. So at that time, we had something in our own hands. But at this time, we are using only our moral voice. As soon as this Ukrainian aggression happened, the elders strongly criticized President Putin. And I, we soon realized that uh, when there were a lot of human cry and criticism that 
President Putin should be convicted as war criminals or genocide, etc. We realize that the international legal system is not perfect. There is not such a provision or legal background that he can be convicted as a crime of aggression. There are some legal background, legal, you know, when it comes to genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, etc. But when it comes to crime of aggression, the member states of the United Nations have, have been discussing this matter but have not been able to agree on that. That's one loophole now. The chief investigator of ICC, International Criminal Court, had already begun investigation. In the name of the elders, if there is not enough legal background, then we should establish a special criminal tribunal. Of course, it will take a long time. It can be vetoed by Russia again. So there is a limitation. That's what I really sympathize with my successor, Antonio Guterres, current Secretary General of the United Nations. There has been a lot of criticism and disappointment. What the United Nations has been doing, why United Nations is not able to take any firm action. I fully share your concern, but at this time, reality is reality. We have to face sharply and clearly, realistically, what is the limitation of the United Nations, what are the limitations of the big powers like the United States and European Union. But one thing is clear, one thing is clear, this kind of aggression must be condemned and should be taken to international court, whatever it may be. Uh, in that regard, again, recently, the reform of the Security Council, reform of the United Nations have been also risen as uh, quite uh, significant, serious issues at this time. I know that while working as a Secretary General, I have been receiving this kind of uh, complaints and uh, sort of some suggestions. Why don't you reform? the Security Council? Why don't you reform this United Nations as a whole? That is what I feel very sorry that I do not have a clear answer to you today, but I'm sure that international community will not condone what has been happening at this time. There must be a accountability about this. There must be justice Justice process, that's what I expect. In that regard, uh, you should uh, take note that um, because we have been so much disappointed and frustrated by the use of veto power, regardless of what, the General Assembly of the United Nations held an emergency session and adopted a re resolution by consensus that if and when the members of P5 use veto powers, and then within 10 days, the General Assembly should dis discuss this matter, even though the General Assembly may not have any binding force. I'm sure that even though it may not have binding force, it will affect psychologically and politically big impact to the members of the P5 whenever they use veto power they may have to think twice. Now, international community may be more and more uh, critical about this. This is my only hope at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the former Secretary General had a, um, a memoir that came out last year, and if you haven't read it, I commend it to you. I've had the, the, the great opportunity and privilege of reading it over the last week. And, and I was fascinated to learn about your childhood and about the ways that the UN 
factored into your life at a very early age as you grew up in a nation at war and in a nation that was in a very positive way affected by what the United Nations could make possible. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about, about your youth, about your kind of realization about what the United Nations is and how it factored into your young life. Korea was a child of United Nations. When Korea was attacked in 1950 by North Korea and China joining, that it was the United Nations which sent 16, 16 countries sent their soldiers and five more countries sent humanitarian like uh, medical, medical teams. Without United Nations, Korea would not be here today as it is, and I would not be speaking to you as I am now. So I was sort of a um, child of war, but later I became a man of peace, man of peace, and I am deeply grateful. You should understand that when the UN Security Council decided and recommended to dispatch military soldiers to deter, to deter North Korean aggression, I think that was the first and the last in the history of the United Nations. Then United Nations used enforcement power by the Security Council decision. Of course, there may be some misunderstanding between enforcement power and UN peacekeeping forces. At this time, there are 12 UN peacekeeping forces. During my time, there were 16, 16 peacekeeping forces. But peacekeeping and peace enforcing are two different measures, two different systems. The United Nations has never been able to dispatch peace enforcing forces. It is normally done in the name of coalitions, coalitions, whoever really wanted to join. So when it came to Afghanistan, Iraq, or Vietnam War, the United, Nation, United States organized a sort of a coalitions. They were never been approved, supported, by the United, United Nations. In that regard, Koreans, and we should be very much grateful. And we have been lucky, in a sense. That's why it has changed my life as a Korean government officials, as a boy growing up during extreme poverty and dangerous times but I became much, much more conscious, conscious about peace and security. How this peace can affect the human lives. When there is a war, you cannot expect that you can have any uh, freedom or you can expect that your human rights can be uh, protected. Just when I was, um, 12 years old boy. At that time, there was an uprising in Hungary. I wrote a letter on behalf of my school's friends, writing a letter to then Secretary General Daga Hamashut. Mr. Secretary General, please help those young people who are being killed and beaten by Soviet Union. I didn't expect exactly 50 years later I would be standing on the same place where my long-term predecessor Dag Hamashult would be standing. While making my acceptance speech, I appealed to the world. I really hope, I sincerely hope that during my time as a Secretary General, I would not receive such kind of a letters of appeal from young, 
young people around the world. That was my humble and genuine wish. But during my time, 10 years as Secretary General, I have been receiving so many things. I have been dealing with so many conflict issues. Maybe the current issue of Ukraine, it may it definitely, it may be regarded by historians that one of the most serious conflict the United Nations and international community has not been able to dealt with. So we have to learn the lessons from the past. Thank you. Thank you. And, and um, I want to correct a mistake I made as we began, which is we are joined by members of, of, this, of uh, the Secretary General's family. And I want to introduce Madam. Thank you very much. His, his wife is with us. And um, thank you very much for being here. And we are also joined by his son and his daughter. And uh, both, it was a, a bit of a surprise reunion for the family. This is, I learned, the first time they've been together since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so we're glad that this could happen. And we're grateful that you're here. So thank you. Um, so, so staying on the thread of peace and security and the role of the United Nations in that, during your tenure as Secretary General, you, um, you had to contend with the Arab Spring. And I wonder if you could kind of reflect on that moment for us, what, what, how the Arab Spring presented a challenge to you at the United Nations and in your role, how you reacted, and what we learned from that moment. Normally, we think that peace and security is the most important issues. Three pillars of the United Nations, are peace and security, uh, development, and human rights. They are three pillars of the UN Charter, but they are tightly interconnected. It cannot go, one cannot go alone on its own way. Of course, if there is no peace and security, you cannot engage in social and economic, economic activities. Of course, your human rights cannot be guaranteed. There is um, abuse of human rights. At the same time, if economic situation, social situation is not stable, then there is no political leader who can maintain their political leadership. And economic activities cannot be done. They are interrelated. Now, when it comes to human rights, if, suppose that there is a peace and security, there is a prosperous economic development, if uh, your human rights are not protected, then it's just meaningless. In that regard, I've been always stating that upholding the human rights is the most important issue. But in reality, you cannot say just, you cannot claim, you know, I have a human right when in, in front of the bayonet or guns. That's why United Nations made it quite clear that justice is the most important process. I have been speaking out that justice will follow. There will be justice. If not now, if not today, then tomorrow. If not tomorrow, sometime soon, justice will prevail. Those three pillars I have been speaking out, I have been really trying to uphold the three pillars of the United Nations. Of course, I have a limited mandate, limited power, limited capacity, limited resources. That had to be supported by the member states 193 member states, particularly country like the United States, US support, US leadership, and global leadership has always been important source of keeping peace, making economic development, and keeping human rights. Those are something which I am still believing and in the end, in the end, when you really support 
uh, nurture the principles of the United Nations, I think we will be able to live in a better world where human rights are protected and where peace and security will be uh, protected. Yeah. Thank you. And can I ask you, with that as the mandate, when the Arab Spring happened and you were confronted with human rights abuses, um, civil conflict, and chemical weapons usage, the UN was forced to take action to take a stand. And I wonder how you negotiated that for yourself and within the United Nations in order to be an effective actor. I'm still uh, <clears throat> feel uh, regrettable that Arab Spring, uh, which started from Tunisia in uh, 2011, early 2011, has been stopped so soon without seeing all this realization of what we have been aspiring for. As you recall that this Arab Spring started from a just a poor, powerless young man called Mohammed Bouazizi in Tunisia. He was beaten by police while you know, trying to sell something on the street. He was a street vendor. Tunisian people rose against this one, against brutality of police. Starting, seemingly starting with the very minor incident, brutality by a police has been spreading like a wildfires across Middle East. Ben Ali, then president, had to uh, run, away, run away from his country to Saudi Arabia. And this, this fire spread like wildfires to uh, Iraq and Egypt and Libya and Syria. Unfortunately, this fire stopped at, at Syria because of the unconditional support by Russia who was abusing the veto power. Not a single humanitarian support could have been delivered to Syrian people at that time. When there was um, credible evidence that the Syrians used chemical weapons, I immediately created, organized an investigation team, investigation, investigation team. President Obama really wanted to bomb the Syria using military powers. At that time, he was, he was deterred by, by the Senate and Congress, American Congress. President Obama wanted to organize some uh, joint actions, including European Union, uh, United Kingdom, UK Prime Minister David Cameron was again deterred by his own parliament. That was there when Arab Spring just stopped. As much as to that, I felt very proud when I was able to speak out and I was able to work with the world leaders and Arab people. I visited Egypt. I strongly announced, I strongly shouted out, strongly, that Mubarak must step down immediately. Just seven days after my such urging, he stepped down. I fought a lot with Gaddafi. Of course, you know, he was very defiant, very, very much defiant, would not listen to any any advice of the United Nations. Finally, the United Nations, for the first time in the history of the United Nations, was able to use force, using NATO forces. I think that was the only time when Security Council was united, united, allowing to use military force to, to stop this unacceptable torture and oppression 
over their own people. Of course, Gaddafi was not killed by NATO forces. He was killed by his own people. But I still feel very much regret that United Nations could have not been done much. That's why Syrian people are still suffering. Six million Syrians have become refugees somewhere in Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Turkey. Those four countries are hosting millions of Syrian refugees. I myself visit all these refugee camps and trying to give a sense of hope. I've been always talking to them. Look, I was like you. I was also like yourselves. I was a young boy, helpless, without any, any means to live. But now you have United Nations. So that was the, my constant message of hope uh, to the people, particularly young people, young people. But now I think the uh, United Nations should do mo much more. Now, when it comes to Ukraine, more than six million people have become refugees, much more than Syrian refugees who have been spreading, resettled in four countries. Now this is adding much, much more problems, much, much more difficulties and burden to the United Nations. Now we have all, more than 80 million refugees. Now, this number, 80 million refugees, are the ones only during the time of Second World War. We have that number, that many number of refugees during Second World War. Seemingly, we are living in 21st century where people should be able to live and enjoy the development of science and technologies, economy and transportation and communications. Why then there should be so many people during, like, like during the Second World War, so far now. That's because of the leadership, lack of political leadership. The political leadership lacking global citizenship. They do not have any global vision. I am deeply, deeply sorry to say this one. During my time, 10 years as a Secretary General, I have not been able to meet many global leaders with global vision. At best, those leaders are national leaders. It's a hard, very hard, to find the real global leaders with a global vision and global citizenship. I hope that young students here you have to raise your voice. I think you have such a right and duty now. I don't have much hope, much expectation to the current leadership. It's only you, young people. You have to raise, challenge your president, challenge your senators, challenge your, even your prof professors. Tell them, tell them that, look, Mr. Senator, this is the world where we are going to live. Why don't you do your own work as a global citizen? This has been my continuous message. I would like to pick up on that, the, the comment you just made about global citizens and global leadership. And I wonder, when you have found that around the, the globe, and particularly during your tenure at the United Nations, when you found global leaders, people who had the vision, the perspective, was there, what did you find, I guess, over time to be the, the set of ingredients that could lead to them being able to have that broader vision and bigger vision and to join you in those conversations? Global citizens are those who regard themselves as a citizen of the world, not necessarily belonging to a certain country or certain locality. But in reality, we may have to carry, when you travel, 
when you cross over the border, you have to present your passport. I am citizen of Korea, I'm citizen of United States. But this is merely just um, administrative issues at this time, in this 21st century, with the transformative development of science, technology, transportation, particularly communication. Whatever we discuss today now, it can be transmitted by a fraction of a second. So there is no such border. Borders are meaningless. When you believe, when you think you are belonging to this global world, then you are a global citizen. When you think that I will do something only for my locality, then you can never be a global citizen. When I was just a high school boy, I was lucky enough to be invited by the American Red Cross. And at that time, there were about 140 young students. We were invited to the White House by then President John F. Kennedy. I was 18 years old. I was not even met, able to meet mayor of my own city, not to mention the president of Korea at that time. What a big difference. At that time, what President Kennedy said, political leaders are not getting along well, but you can get along well because you are young. National boundaries do not mean much. He said, exactly, national boundaries do not mean much. National boundaries were strictly established at that time. You could not cross the borders, particularly between East and West. At that time, I was deeply inspired by what he said. Of course, I could not understand fully what he meant. After having become Secretary General of the United Nations, dealing with so many world leaders, I realized what Kennedy said was a real meaning, real meaning of global citizenship. So immediately after my retirement from the United Nations, what I did first was establishing Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens. It's located in headquarters in Vienna, Vienna, Austria. The, I am now still speaking out to young people that please have empathy. You may have passion, but there are not many people who do have to combine their passion with compassion, empathy. It's very important that you have empathy and compassion for others. It's your prerogative. It's only natural that young people have compassion. But when you have only passion, you may not end up as a global citizen. This is what I'm speaking to you, to the students. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to ask one more question, and then I want to open it up for questions from the audience. And if, you're, if you'd like to ask a question, um, I invite you to go to the microphone in the middle of the room, uh, and we'll, we'll take questions there for about 15 minutes. My, my last question goes directly to an issue I know that's very much on the minds of many of our students and students around the world and, and matters much to, to young people, and that's climate change. One of the things that you prioritized when you became Secretary General was a global climate agreement, and you were part of the Paris Accord. And I wonder if you might comment on, what you, again, what you encountered as you began as Secretary General, how you brokered uh, an agreement, and, and how you think the world is doing on this front at this point. Still, still I feel proud to have prioritized the climate change, women's empowerment, and sustainable development goals, uh, youth empowerment. Those are three or four areas I have really devoted my time and energy. And I was lucky enough to have been able to convince the political will of the world leaders. That's what we call Paris Climate Change Agreement. 
The decision-making process is very strange. Not a single country should not object. This was adopted by 195 state parties. At that time, if a one country said no, this would not have been possible. Normally, we are talking about majority rule or two-third rule, but this is 100 unanimity, absolute unanim unanimity. In that regard, we were very lucky enough. Then have we done enough until now? I don't think so. I am angry by the lack of political will, by the lack of progress, by the big powers, including the United States. What did President Trump do? Metaphorically speaking, we are standing on the precipice of the big changes. If we fall down under this precipice, then we have no hope. That's why I have been really raising my voice even after my retirement, all the times, that we must, first of all, raise the ambition level, ambition level. I think it can be done. Normally, political leaders, they are highly am ambitious. But all this ambition has been used on other issues for their re-election or taking political leadership. But what political leadership, what is more important than political leadership is, I think, climate change. To make this humanity and planet Earth livable continuously for our succeeding generation. Why I'm speaking out like this way, the big countries, rich countries including the United States, have made big promises. First of all, they said that in 2009 in Copenhagen, we will provide every year, $100 billion for those developing countries. Because developing countries, they are the least contributing countries to climate phenomena. It's the United States, China, and European Union, industrialized countries who have contributed much, much more to current level of greenhouse gas emissions, current level of climate crisis, but they have not done it. I expected that last year in November in Glasgow, the people would be united, but they were not able to have a firm agreement. They just passed the buck to, again, uh, this year's Sham El Sheikh uh, COP27. I have been really urging world leaders Unless we, we should contain the global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees, we will not have any hope. We will have to regret what will happen to our humanity, succeeding generation. We are not talking about only our or our children's uh, generation. We are talking about millennia, millennia of years, a succeeding generation, so that our succeeding generation can live in peace, harmony, and safety. And our planet Earth, our planet Earth is on fire, figuratively, literally. We have been experiencing unexpectedly strong you know, rainfalls, wildfires, temperature rising. This is not usual one. This must be stopped by, at least by 2050, we must make carbon neutrality zero to zero by that. Then we have to mobilize all political will. I think Partnership, 
political will, mobilizing all necessary resources. That will be the answer at this time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me open it up for questions from the audience. If you're interested in asking a question, please yeah, form a, a short line. We'll only probably have time for, for three or four questions. Um, and I invite you to introduce yourself and, and pose your question. So. Uh, we have a mass ask question. What's that? Yeah, to, okay. to ask the question, cool. please feel Sorry. free. Hi, my name is Nathan. Um, thank you so much, Secretary General, for being here. It's an absolute honor to see you speak. Um, I didn't model UN in high school and college, so this is like very cool to see someone who you know ran the actual United Nations. Um, but as a young person, I'm 24, a lot of my friends are the same age, or 25 actually now. Um, I think, you know, building the last two points, there's a lot of concern over global issues. Like a lot of my friends, we know that we're gonna be dealing with climate change, you know, uh, heightened levels of international conflict. And one thing that we kind of feel sometimes is like a sense of hopelessness. And I know a lot of what you've been trying to say is like there is hope. So I was wondering if you could, you know, if you had a, a rallying cry or a message or a motivational, you know, speech you wanted to give to people in my situation who feel like we have these big challenges but don't know how to fix them, what would be, what would you want, what would you say? Yeah, so the question is for, for the gentleman is, I think, 24, maybe just turned 25, and, uh, and, and realizes that his generation faces a set of challenges that seem greater than those that our generations have faced. Climate, for sure, more international conflict. And is there advice you might give him and his, his fellow young people as to how to contend with these things? That, that, that is why, of course, you know, it's true that there is a generational gap. The current generation, I think, should be lucky, feeling lucky. Uh, somehow, they have been you know, uh, muddling through all this uh, uh, crisis. And, but the nature will, be, will become more and more, I think, uh, stronger and harsher. So we have to really address the reality. That's why I have been really urging political leaders that do more, do more and better for future generations, younger generations, because they will just without any reason will be affected in their own, own lives. That's why, again, uh, I created some uh, youth empowerment initiative. Uh, again, for the first time in the UN history, I established Youth Empowerment Office and appointed young, young envoy, envoy of the Secretary General. I think this is going on, but we need to be, we must do far more, far more for young generations so that uh, they can really be able to um, have a quality education, have uh, decent jobs, and their future should be uh, guaranteed without any, any fear. SDG, SDG uh, eight, goal number eight, uh, is about decent job, decent job. One can have jobs, but these jobs should be a decent job, decent job. That is meant for young generation so that uh, there should be no, not much uh, generational gaps. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and please speak very close to the mic. It, it, the this room good? Is stop. There you go. All yes. right. <laughs> so thank you for coming to see us and speak to us today, uh, former secretary. It's an honor to be here. And obviously, as a student of both CUNY School of Law and here at the CCNY Global uh, uh, Colum Powell School, um, I am kind of dealing with a lot of intersectionality and how things really need to crisscross in ways and we're aware of that, that we maybe weren't in your generation. Uh, and my question is really to the idea that in a world that is increasingly isolationist, as we kind of see in every country, whether it's the elections in France or the elections here, what place do you see for a kind of a humanity first or what you call a globalist core motivation and directive that is kind of cloaked or filtered through a regional, national, or local perspective so that we can address issues um, that cross national borders while still, but that still affect everybody locally, such as climate change and regional conflicts. 
Again, I have some uh, problem in uh, clearly understanding the question. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, question, the question relates to, you know, as we see this trend towards nationalism and nationalist tendencies um, in the United States, in France just now in the elections, what, what do you see as the way to get countries to pivot towards a kind of global perspective? Uh, first of all, I, I would appreciate if you uh, bring that microphone closer uh, so somehow I have yeah, can we, can we do that? Or in fact, if you can either move the microphone closer or instead we can invite you to come down and use the microphone when you ask questions, which might be easier. Uh -huh. Why don't we do that? So we'll, we'll do that about, for the next uh, question. About second question, this is something about uh, the global, global vision again and by the politicians. Uh, normally politicians are too much ambitious. They have a passion. When I was dealing with um, many political leaders and I appealed them, please do this and that, please help United Nations, uh, their answers have always been, I will fully support you, Secretary General, don't worry. But let me be re-elected first. I need to be re-elected. If I am no longer president, how can, you, can, how can I help you? This is a very short-sighted vision. This we cannot call a global citizen. So uh, I think uh, when you elect either local or national leaders, I think you should carefully analyze whether this candidate is a person with the global citizens, or if this candidate is only minding for local, local interest or one's own interest. I think that's, that's the point which we can make um, our situation uh, better and different. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to come down to the very front? You can either, if that mic comes out, great. If not, you can use a mic down here. There we go. Is this better, the former secretary? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not a matter of hearing because uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Professor Rich is, has much better understanding of all this uh, sound, the, you know, what just as evaporates uh, around. Uh, yeah. As beautiful as this room is, the acoustics are lousy. So, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, like everybody else, I'd like to thank you first for coming here and talking to us. Uh, this is a question a little more specific to international relations. Uh, President Biden has framed um, the conflict ha between autocracies and democracies as the greatest challenge for the 21st century. But um, just this last week, uh, the writer Fareed Zakaria wrote that, and he pointed out that large democracies like India, Brazil, uh, Mexico, South Africa have not imposed sanctions on Russia. Um, and he said that maybe the way to frame this uh, challenge for the 21st century is not between autocracies and democracies because these countries might not upheld, uphold democracy since they have such close relationships with these autocratic states like Brazil, India, and South Africa are in the BRICS trade bloc, which trades with Russia and China. But rather, the West and the United States should focus on uh, respecting international law and norms, like invading another country and annexing territory by force. Do you agree with that view? Do you think um, that we will have peace in the world and be more successful at it if we focus on maintaining international law, maintaining these international norms, the UN Charter, instead of focusing on this battle between democracies and autocracies. And just as an example that he gives is Singapore, which is not a very democratic country, but has imposed sanctions on Russia because um, it invaded another country in the next uh, is trying to annex territory by force. So I just wanted to know from you if you agree with that view 
that maybe we should focus more on international law and norms instead of this battle between democracies and autocracies. I, I really respect uh, President Biden. Uh, I, when he was a vice president, uh, I had been working very closely with him uh, as a team of uh, President Obama. Uh, at the same time, if I may speak about uh, President Trump, I really you know, uh, was disappointed, even though I didn't have any, any work with him because I was no longer Secretary General. Now, uh, President Biden's leadership at this time, together with all these uh, South American countries uh, elsewhere, I think, I, I, I'm sure that the U.S. will be able to restore, restore confidence and trust from other countries. Uh, when uh, President Biden really continues this way, but at the same time, there are some tendencies and open, open uh, American government, whoever the president may be, uh, sometimes have their interest and their interest first, put first. It is very important that the United States uh, should work very closely, not only with the regional, regional issues here, but also European Union and Africans. And I, th I think uh, US government should do much more on these African issues too, because they do not have uh, much. When all the member states of the United Nations are not, uh, are not economically and socially um, uh, sustainable, then U.S. will not even be uh, sustainable. This is one thing which we need to learn. I know that in Brazil and some other you know, uh, countries that they have uh, some uh, undesirable, undesirable leadership and uh, attitude. So th this, these are something, some uh, source of concern for me as now even a private citizen. Uh, but when I am feeling that kind of feeling as a private citizen, then I think all the people around the world will feel the same. In that regard, I think uh, sometimes US, we, we really count on US leadership on a sense a little bit uh, firm and stronger positions whenever you see some uh, undesirable uh, democratic leaders. This is something which I want to do. And there are many regional organizations at this time around the world. And then uh, we really count on US will continue to uh, coordinate with the United, with countries as well as uh, regional, regional groups, yeah. So thank you. Thank you for your question. We are, we're running short on time, and so I'm afraid we're not gonna be able to take all of the questions, but if the last two folks in line wanna come up, and we'll, we'll ask, have you both ask your questions, and then, Mr. Secretary General, you can address whichever parts you might want to. Just uh, raise the mic. Uh, thank you for coming here, uh, Secretary General. So my question is, um, in this era of uh, dual pandemics, Sorry, um, in this era of dual pandemics of both nationalism as well as COVID and a society that some, where some states have taken a more flexible approach to human rights in regards to COVID, how can the UN promote um, global vision and global leadership? Global leadership, global cooperation, I think that's, that can be said sort of a partnership, global partnership. You mentioned of a pandemic. Pandemic can just uh, affect the whole the countries. Pandemic doesn't have any uh, boundaries, you know, national boundaries. It just affects everybody. Uh, what is important at this time, 
to handle climate, pandemic, and all other issues, we need to forge a global partnership, global partnership. Without global partnership, I think nothing can be done, nothing can be done. The United Nations has announced the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals, starting from poverty eradication, quality education, or a pandemic, health, decent jobs, et cetera, et cetera. At the end, at the end, number 17, last goal is a partnership, partnership. Then without forging partnership among government leaders, business leaders, and civil society leaders, this tripartite partnership, that's the only answer to address all current political, economic, and the security issues. Therefore, uh, I'm really urging that the leaders, particularly political leaders, they should have a wisdom. Not only themselves, they cannot do it alone. Politicians, they cannot do it alone. They have to have a full support. The business leaders, they should really follow and implement what the United Nations has presented. And then without working with the civil society, citizens, students, academic institutions, I think they should all be a part of this process. So I'm just uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, a global uh, citizens. Often we say that the United States is the strongest, most powerful country in the world. But however powerful one may be, however resourceful one may be, you cannot do it alone. All these global issues like a climate, pandemic, that must be done all together. When one border is just contaminated, affected by this pandemic, this will surely cross other borders. That's the hard lessons which we have learned. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And last question. Um, hello, Mr. Moon. Um, I'm also a student here. Um, I wanted to ask something that's been really popular. I wanted to, sorry, <laughs> I'm taking my mask off. Um, I wanted to ask about something that's really um, a big concern among younger people, and that's the sustainability of American hegemony. Um, someone mentioned it earlier, uh, Western nations imposing sanctions on countries that do not align with their particular stance on the conflict often places the punishment on underprivileged people rather than the decision makers or the ruling classes. Um, I wanted to ask whether you have found that this unipolar grip has um, been reason for prolonging or inciting international conflicts around the world um, and how we as the people of the country can combat that. Sorry. We're going to try it once more just because the acoustics are, are, are not easy in this room. Yeah. I just wanted to ask about how you feel about the role of America in the international stage and how, yeah, American authority in the international stage. The role of American hegemony across the globe. There is, there, there has been always a certain... Uh, uh, controversies and criticism about uh, what's so-called American hegem hegemonism. This is something which has happened in the human history. Human history. That does not mean that I support American hegemonism. In this world, in this world, of course, you know we we really need American leadership. I fully support American global leadership. When 
frankly speaking, if we, we, has, we have to do point one country, at this time, I think that will be United States. There is no, uh, no, uh, no other opinions that United States is the superpower and country. But if any tendency of a hegemonism is exercised by the United States, and then I think the United States will, may not be respected and may not be supported by other countries. Therefore, again, the, my answer is going back to uh, global citizens. We do hope that Americans will exercise uh, their global leadership, but working together, working together closely with the other countries, particularly with the United Nations, U.S. should empower, empower United Nations. I think without the help of the United Nations, uh, United States, UN will find it very difficult, very difficult. Often, often, US also has been casting veto powers when it comes to a specific uh, issues which may not be beneficial to United States. But US should think about on a global, global vision. One good example of a sort of a hegemonism was exercised during, I think, uh, President Trump's time. There may be some of you who supported President Trump, but regardless of what you know, what your political orientation may be, I think the last four years, Americans have not been respected widely as they used to be. They used to be. Because of the leadership difference, leadership difference, when President Biden was elected, I'm neither a Republican or a Democrat. I'm just a global citizen as a former Secretary General of the United Nations. To my mind, that was not what U.S. should have done during the last four years. With Biden coming in as president, I, th I think uh, most of the countries around the world, they have some relief, relief. Now I think he should do then much better to recover, to bring back American leadership without hegemonism, without sense of hegemonism. U.S. should be able to speak more friendlier or better with some small countries, like developing countries, care more, care more for developing countries, and you can use less for your own. You are the number one, most resourceful, most powerful in terms of energy, political power. So that is what the people of the world expect the genuine global leadership from the United States. And I'm sure that uh, you will do. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. I want to thank everybody very much for joining us today. I want to thank Cy and Laurie Sternberg, Gene Krasno, um, and thank all of you for being with us.